This is our very first hybrid event. Uh, we haven't been in person in years. We've never done a hybrid event before, so I hope everyone in the room and watching online gives us a whole lot of grace today. We're gonna do our best. But it's really exciting, it's, it's so great to be here. So on behalf of the Better Life Lab and the Council on Contemporary Families, I wanna welcome all of you here uh, and also online, hopefully across the country or world. Uh, 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 I'm Bridget Schulte, I'm a writer, journalist, and the director of the Better Life Lab, and I also want to welcome you all here on International Women's Day. Uh, and I think it's perfectly appropriate, <laughs> perfectly appropriate to then uh, be here talking about gender equality, where we are, where we've been, and really where we need to go. So I don't need to tell anyone here uh, to level set sort of where we've been. You know, decades before the pandemic, gender equality is, uh, it is, it has been a um, very slow, and in some cases, many of you here uh, have written about a stalled gender progress. Um, you know, uh, women entered the workforce in mass. Uh, their lives changed utterly in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and on, and very little in the United States changed with them. We really didn't get any family support of public policy. We still don't. Uh, businesses would sort of grudgingly maybe give some kind of flexibility or scheduled control to a select few, but that was always seen as an accommodation for a lesser worker, you know, you know uh, fast track to the mommy track, so to speak. And for many low wage or essential workers, they were often left out with absolutely nothing. Um, men uh, didn't change much either you know, when it comes to the, <laughs> to the division of labor. Uh, you know, so we were left really before the pandemic in a situation where uh, women were, you know, the, the old not just having it all, but really doing it all. Uh, really burdened with uh, not only work, but heavy care responsibilities, still being seen as the primary care response, uh, uh, primary or the default carer, you know, not just for children, but for uh, loved ones with disabilities, for, um, you know, for, for aging parents. So, uh, you know, that led to enormous gender gaps, wealth gaps, power gaps, uh, enormous gender inequality, as so many of you here and online have been studying and writing and, and thinking about for so long. And so that leads us to the pandemic, and we all know what happened. Overnight, all of that lack of care infrastructure, all of that inequality really was laid bare. If you didn't know it, it was absolutely apparent you couldn't miss it. And so that's what we're really gonna be doing today, is what did we learn three years into it, where yes, we've got vaccines, uh, you know, yes, there's more herd immunity, but there are still variants circulating out there. There's still um, immuno immunocompromised people. Um, we're still in the midst of, you know, you know, explosions of cold, RSV and flu. If you've got children, uh, you know, uh, childcare is just as disrupted now for many as it was uh, at the height of the pandemic. So we're still not out of this pandemic. But where do we go? Um, you know, uh, what is the, the, the business leadership from the top we need? What is the demand from the bottom that we need? Uh, what is the legislation, the policy, the regulation, and even the litigation that we need to really move forward. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, so the last thing I'll leave you with is last week we had an event with the brilliant Jody Heyman and her team at the uh, World Policy Analysis Center. Uh, and one of the things that our, uh, our fellow Haley Swenson has written about is that um, gender equality, uh, uh, achieving gender parity, the World Economic Forum anticipates will take us 99 years, 257 years for equal labor force participation, 268 years for closing the economic gender gap. So I think we can do better than that. Jody, uh, Jody and her uh, colleagues argue that we can have gender equality in our lifetime, but it will take a lot of work. So let's get to it. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping business before I introduce our two main uh, presenters. Uh, so attendees, join, attendees joining us virtually, you can submit your questions uh, through the Slido box, which is located to the right hand of your screen. And for attendees in the room uh, with us, you can scan the QR codes on your table to submit questions. Um, you know, that will open up the Slido box and you can type your question in. 
uh, we'll get them on an iPad. We'll be able to um, uh, ask them that way. For those of you who might be technologically challenged or who might be having Wi-Fi issues, you, there's also pen and paper, uh, good old school uh, modes of communication. And then write your questions on the paper and then we'll have a staffer at the back. You can just drop them off there and they will add them to the, the Slido. So. Um, uh, we really want this to be uh, interactive, lots of, lots of opportunity for, for questions. The event today will have uh, Richard and Dan present their uh, research. That's going to be followed by a fireside chat that we have with Representative Ro Khanna, who has a very interesting frame on child care, uh, paid leave, and family policies, including it in what he calls an economic patriotism agenda. So we'll be talking about that, and then followed by a panel discussion. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce our two presenters. So Dan Carlson is known to many of you. He is an associate professor in family and consumer studies at the University of Utah. His research examines the links between family process, social inequalities, and health disparities, with a particular focus on gender inequalities in families. He's on the board for the, for the Council of, uh, on Contemporary Families and deputy editor of the Journal of Marriage and Family. His research findings have been published in numerous academic journals, and he's also uh, been featured in a number of national and international outlets. Um, and Richard Petz, he's a professor of sociology at Ball State University. His research focuses on the intersection of family work, gender, and policy, with a specific emphasis on parental leave, father involvement, and workplace flex flexibility as policies and practices that can reduce gender inequality, promote greater uh, work-family balance, and improve family well-being. Uh, his new book, Father Involvement and Gender Equality in the United States, Contemporary Norms and Barriers, focuses on the issues of persisting gender inequality in the realms of both domestic and paid work, seeking to understand barriers to greater father involvement at home and uh, identify strategies to increase father involvement and promote greater gender equality. Um, they, uh, I could go on. They're both incredibly uh, accomplished, and I will leave it to them to take it from here. So again, welcome. Great. Um, thanks, Bridget, for uh, that introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone attending the symposium today, uh, whether in person um, or online. The camera's over there. Hello. Welcome. Um, before we get started, uh, Richard and I would just like to extend some thanks to the people who made today possible. So thank you to Bridget Schulte uh, and Rebecca Gale and Haley Swenson of the Better Life Lab for helping us plan this event. Uh, thank you to Angela Spadette um, and the folks at New America for allowing us to use the space and helping us organize this. Thank you to the Council on Contemporary Families uh, for co-sponsoring this event uh, and to the National Science Foundation for funding our work. Um, and, you know, last but not least, uh, thank you, where is she, to Joanna Pepin. Raise your hand. <laughs> thank you, Joanna. Um, Joanna uh, worked with us to draft and field the initial survey for this study uh, back in spring of uh, 2020. Um, and indeed, back in March 2020, Joanna, Richard, and I were working on a paper using the American Time Use Survey. Um, and the pandemic hit, and so we asked the question, was anybody at the American Time Use Survey collecting data on parents' time use at this time? Um, and really, back then, it was like time seemed of the essence, right, to capture the effects of societal lockdowns and school closures and furloughs and remote work on parents' work and family. Um, and we found out, right, that the American Time Use Survey had been suspended. So we moved very quickly uh, to develop and field the survey, uh, which we titled the study uh, Parents' Division of Labor During COVID, the SPDLC. Back then, none of us really envisioned how long the pandemic would last. And we certainly did not anticipate that we would be standing here three years on the cusp of the anniversary of that pandemic on National Women's Day, uh, ready to share four waves of data about changes um, in parents' lives during the pandemic, but nevertheless, right, uh, here we are. Um, the SPDLC was designed to assess changes in parents' divisions of labor during the pandemic 
to identify the factors that were implicated in those changes, and then to consider the consequences of those changes for gender inequality long term uh, and parents' well being. Now, because we focus on the division of labor and families, our, our survey really was designed for um, you know, partnered parents with children in the home. And though we surveyed both uh, parents in different sex couples and same sex couples, uh, we're going to talk to you today largely about our findings uh, related to uh, different sex couples. We administered this survey via Prolific, which cultivates panelists for opt in online surveys. Um, so we have a panelist, uh, we have panelists that we followed for four waves. First wave in April 2020, then again in November 2020, October 2021, and October 2022. At each of those waves, we also introduced uh, a new set of respondents and incorporated them into the panel and have followed them since. Um, so to date, we've surveyed just over 4,500 um, unique parents who reported for themselves and their partners. Uh, and around 60% of those folks have participated in at least one follow-up. So, as I mentioned, the primary aim of this study was to assess changes in parents' divisions of both paid and unpaid labor during the pandemic. Um, and indeed, those divisions of labor did change. Um, and they changed in some very interesting and patterned ways uh, that I'm going to talk to you about today. So first, uh, let's look at the division of domestic labor, housework and childcare. So prior to the pandemic, um, in different sex couples, you know, the most, the majority of folks were in a you know, what we call a traditional arrangement, where mothers were primarily responsible for, for these domestic tasks. Um, but this changed early in the pandemic as fathers started doing a larger share um, of housework and childcare. And so early in the pandemic, non-traditional arrangements where you know, partners were either sharing domestic responsibilities equally or maybe fathers were doing um, the majority of tasks themselves, this became just as prevalent as traditional arrangements. Now, over time, we have reverted back in a lot of ways to the pre-pandemic situation. Nevertheless, there remains a small um, but significant uh, increase in the number of couples that have non-traditional domestic arrangements today. Of course, general trends are great for understanding change, um, but it's also important to realize that, that parents' experiences vary and that they all didn't experience the pandemic in the same way. Um, and so what we wanted to do was identify different trajectories of change uh, for parents' divisions of labor. Um, and so you see the results of those trajectories here on the screen. Now, the first thing I want to point out is that for the vast majority of couples, their arrangements didn't change, right? They either maintained a tradi traditional um, division of housework and child care uh, across the pandemic, um, or they maintained a non-traditional division across the pandemic. But for a non-trivial proportion, there was change. Some of that change was temporary, but some of that change has been more permanent. So if we look first at housework here on the right, the gray line shows that about 25% of couples went from being more likely to have a traditional housework arrangement before the pandemic to now being more likely to have a non-traditional arrangement. And we see something very similar with childcare. Right? The blue line for the child care graph shows that about 20% of parents went from having a traditional arrangement before the pandemic to a non-traditional arrangement in early April and have maintained that arrangement for the last three years. The black line shows that roughly one in six parenting couples um, transitioned to a non-traditional arrangement early in the pandemic and then eventually reverted back to a traditional arrangement uh, by fall of, of 2021. It is well documented, right, with respect to paid work, that both mothers and fathers uh, suffered job loss uh, early in the pandemic, and that this was especially true for mothers. Um, so both res with respect to their overall employment as well as their paid work hours. Um, but by fall 2022, we see that there's been a lot of rebound, right? Fathers' rates of employment are just as high uh, today as they were pre-pandemic. And at least as of fall 2022, mothers' employment rates were higher uh, than they were pre-pandemic. Uh, we've seen some rebound in uh, paid work hours, um, but on average, both mothers and fathers are still working a little bit less than what they were uh, before the pandemic started. Again, however, right, there's variation here, um, and it's important to recognize that variation. Um, because mothers' employment has been maybe the primary 
uh, concern of most people during this pandemic. We're gonna focus here today on uh, mother's employment trajectories. So first, looking at the graph on the left, what we see is that for the vast majority of mothers, their employment situation was stable. Right? The gray line at the top shows about 60% of mothers were continuously employed, have been continuously employed across the pandemic. The black line on the bottom shows that about 20% have been continuously out of the labor force. Right? But the blue line shows that around, what, like 8% of mothers left the labor force early in the pandemic and have slowly returned. While the red line shows that about 10% of mothers were not employed prior to the pandemic and have entered the labor force. Now this group is super important, right? Because discussions of the rebound in women's or mother's employment does not take this group into account and therefore masks the fact that there still remains a substantial proportion of mothers who left the labor force and have yet to return to the labor force. Um, looking at mothers uh, paid work hours and those trajectories on the right, Again, we see that for the majority of moms, um, you know, they were working full-time prior to the pandemic and maintained full-time employment. It's about 60% of mothers. Um, but about 15% of mothers, which is represented by the blue line, right, they substantially reduced um, their uh, paid work hours early in the pandemic um, and have returned to uh, full-time work. The red and black lines show us that long-term reductions in paid work hours are really observed amongst mothers who were working part-time prior to the pandemic. So the black line shows that about 20% of mothers were working part-time and have slowly continued to reduce their paid work hours. And then the red line shows that roughly 7% of mothers, those who were, you know, had the weakest labor force attachment, um, they have left the labor force altogether. So overall then, what do the trends show? Um, well, quite honestly, they show, maybe in a small way, movement towards gender egalitarianism um, over the last three years. Uh, slight increases in non-traditional divisions of domestic labor, more labor force participation for mothers uh, today um, than, than pre-pandemic. Um, and so that begs the question then, like, well, what was producing changes, right? A lot of families, there was a lot of stability, not a lot of change, but for a non-trivial proportion, there was change. Some of that change was temporary, some of that change was more permanent. Um, and, you know, when we think about change during the pandemic, maybe the better question is, like, what didn't change? Because everything, right, seemed to change. Um, and a lot of things that are related to the division of labor changed, right? There was changes in domestic supports. There was changes in job flexibility. There was obviously job loss. Um, there was changes in income, right, income loss and changes in breadwinning status. There was increases in our access to paid leave. Um, there was COVID itself, right, and the threat of exposure and the stress associated with that. And then there's been some research showing that parents' gender attitudes changed. Um, now, one thing about so much change um, across so many domains is that it's difficult, therefore, to identify which changes mattered, right, especially for parents' divisions of labor. Now, luckily, the SPDLC, we collected data on all of these factors. Uh, and so we're able, using some very basic um, statistical techniques, to sort of parse their relative contributions. Um, and so our analysis suggests that four factors really mattered for parents' divisions of labor during the pandemic. That was the loss and return of domestic supports, changes in job flexibility, uh, job loss and employment, and then the threat of COVID and the stress associated with that. So first, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna detail how these things changed, what happened in these domains, and then I'll turn it over to Richard and he'll talk to you about how those mattered uh, for uh, parents' divisions of labor. So the loss of domestic supports, right? Societal lockdowns early in the pandemic meant parents lost domestic supports, right? Couldn't go to restaurants, no more housekeepers and house cleaning services, and perhaps most importantly, the loss of childcare and the loss of in-person school. Um, so it's well documented, right, what happened early in the pandemic, but you know, what is the situation currently? Um, and the situation currently seems to be that, at least with respect to childcare, that we are basically in the, the situation we were pre-pandemic in terms of the proportion of parents um, who have their kids in care. So roughly half the parents in our sample had their preschool age children in the care of others prior to the pandemic, and they have returned to that situation as of fall 2022. Um, the situation with schooling is similar, right? In April 2020, 
no kids were in in-person school. Um, by fall 2020, school modalities were highly variable, which meant that schooling for kids was highly variable. About a quarter of kids were in-person full-time. Half were online exclusively. Um, by fall 2021, the majority of kids had moved back to in-person school. Um, but it's important to point out that, you know, even just this last fall, um, the proportion of children in in-person school full-time is still 10% lower than what it was um, pre-pandemic. So we have not you know, returned to, to pre-pandemic um, schooling as yet. Of course, you know, lockdowns not only meant children back in the home, but for many parents it also meant that work now entered the home. And being home and able to work you know, may enhance your ability to attend to domestic needs, but it can also lead to work-family conflict. Um, before the pandemic, the majority of parents did not work from home. Um, you know, 60% of mothers never work from home. Two thirds of fathers never work from home. By April 2020, however, um, three quarters of employed mothers were working from home and two thirds of fathers were working from home. And the majority of them were doing so exclusively. Now, today, remote work remains elevated compared to what it was pre-pandemic, and especially for fathers. And this is important because there used to be a gender gap in remote work. Women used to be more likely than men to work from home. Um, and that difference is now gone. Although mothers are still um, you know, somewhat more likely to work from home exclusively than dads are. Of course, not every job is remote eligible, right? Um, and although some essential occupations remained in person during the pandemic, a lot of non-essential businesses and services closed. Um, and that meant that people lost their jobs. Now, the gender gap in labor force exit during the pandemic has been a big issue and even got its own label. We called it the she session, which is just like a marbles in my mouth word to try to say. Um, and I'm glad I didn't stumble over that. Um, I was very nervous that I would. Um, but the question is, what produced that gap, right? On the one hand, it's possible that women were exiting the labor force voluntarily, right, to uh, attend to increases in domestic needs. At the same time, um, we know that female-dominated industries and occupations were hardest hit by the lockdowns, right? Um, education, hospitality, and so maybe that is the reason for the gap. Um, parents' reports in our study suggest that, yes, mothers were more likely to leave the labor force voluntarily early in the pandemic compared to fathers, um, but the vast majority of labor force exit was involuntary. Um, and today, we don't really see much of a gap uh, gender-wise in terms of of you know, why people are out of, um, of the paid labor force. Although, let's be honest, today unemployment is so low, like it's actually near record lows. Um, so kind of hard to compare there. And then the last thing, right, is COVID. Um, and COVID matters for the division of domestic labor and paid labor by itself for a couple of reasons. One, it affected parents' decisions. It affected their decisions about social distancing. It affected their decisions about school modalities. It affected their decisions about the return of the office. At the same time, worry about COVID and the stress that it produces, um, you know, affects parents' mental health, right? And that affects their ability to work. We asked parents in our study, you know, to assess their level of worry that someone they know would get coronavirus. Um, and obviously, worry has been high throughout the entire pandemic. And it was highest, earliest in the pandemic. But even in fall 2020, half of mothers right, still worried that someone they know would get COVID, and two in five fathers still worried. So worry is high, and mothers have been more worried um, on average than, than dads have been. Um, and that uh, pattern carries over to stress. Um, so stress levels have been highest for moms during the pandemic. They were highest early in the pandemic and they have dropped somewhat over time, but not that much. Now, a big question is, well, how do we, you know, what are stress levels today compared to the past? Um, and that's difficult for us to assess because we didn't, we weren't able, right, to look pre-pandemic at stress, but was, like, was able to find a study from 2009 a nationally representative sample of US men and women that use the same stress scale in their study that we used um, and to be able to construct a comparison. Um, and so what this suggests is that stress levels today are much higher than they were in the past. And I just wanna remind everybody that 2009 was the middle of the Great Recession, 
which would arguably be a period of high stress for a lot of people. So not only is stress higher today than it was back then, but there has been a, an exacerbation right, of the gender gap in stress um, that has continued uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So as Dan illustrated, um, and as we are all well aware, uh, lots, was, lots of things were changing uh, during the pandemic, right? So we use data on all of these various changes to try to identify which factors mattered most uh, from mother's shares of housework, mother's shares of childcare, and mother's employment. And then we use this information to develop recommendations about policies that can help us to work toward greater gender equality moving forward. So looking first at mother's shares of housework, uh, we see that father's remote work was the strongest predictor. So when fathers worked from home more frequently, mothers did fewer shares of housework. Employment also mattered. Uh, so mothers did more shares of housework when fathers were employed, uh, but fewer shares of housework when they themselves were employed. Uh, and mothers did also uh, fewer shares of housework when they were essential workers. And finally, uh, we see that mother's shares of housework increased when they regained access to in-person school and daycare, suggesting that as pandemic conditions started to become more normal, mother's shares of housework increased. Turning to understand trajectories of housework, uh, we focus on the group of parents who changed how they divided housework during the pandemic. And we again see that father's remote work was a strong predictor. So when fathers worked from home more frequently, parents were more likely to change their division of housework. Mother's employment also mattered. Uh, so parents were more likely to shift to a more non-traditional division of housework when mothers remained employed during the pandemic. For mother's shares of childcare, we see a largely similar story. So mother's shares of childcare increased when fathers were employed and when they regained access to in-person school and care, but they decreased when, when mothers themselves were employed and when fathers worked from home more frequently. But we also see a few other factors matter for mother's shares of childcare. And most notably, uh, we see that mother's schedule flexibility matters uh, with mothers doing um, more shares of childcare when they have more flexible schedules. This suggests that similar to fathers, mothers may also utilize workplace flexibility to do more childcare. But whereas fathers' remote work reduces the gender gap in childcare, mothers' schedule flexibility actually increases it. Looking at trajectories of childcare, we again focus on the groups of parents who changed how they divided childcare during the pandemic. And so comparing the became non-traditional to pandemic changers groups, uh, we find that parents were more likely to maintain a more non-traditional division of childcare over the long term when fathers worked from home more frequently, when mothers were employed, and when mothers were not working remotely. Uh, so overall, when considering parents' divisions of housework and childcare during the pandemic, enabling fathers to work from home and maintaining mothers' attachment to the labor force were key in facilitating greater gender equality in domestic labor. So mother's employment was important uh, for establishing a more equal division of domestic labor during the pandemic, but this begs the question, what factors mattered for mother's employment? Well, not surprisingly, access to domestic supports was key. Uh, so mothers were more likely to remain employed when they had access to in-person school and care, when the child attended school and daycare more frequently, and when fathers were home more. In contrast, mothers were less likely to be employed when they were more stressed and more worried about COVID. Because mothers are often primarily responsible for family health and well-being, many mothers sacrificed their employment in an attempt to reduce family health risks during the pandemic. In regard to trajectories of mother's employment, we focus on families where mothers were employed prior to the pandemic and sought to understand why some mothers were able to maintain their labor force attachment, whereas others pulled back. Again, we find domestic support was key. So mothers were more likely to maintain their employment during the pandemic when fathers did more housework and childcare, and when in-person school and care was available. There were also some socioeconomic differences as less educated mothers and mothers who earned less of the family income were more likely to pull back on employment compared to higher educated and higher earning mothers. And finally, we consider the key factors that predicted work hours among mo mothers who were employed prior to the pandemic. We see a similar set of factors matter here as we did for domestic labor and for mother's employment, but the relative importance of these factors differs. Most notably, the strongest predictor of work hours during the pandemic was mother's schedule flexibility, with mothers working fewer hours when they had more flexible schedules. 
This provides additional evidence that mothers used flexible work policies to accommodate increased domestic responsibilities during the pandemic by reducing their work hours. Mothers also reduced their work hours when they were more stressed, but increased their work hours when children attended school or daycare more frequently and when fathers worked from home. So given that we identified a number of factors, or a number of trajectories, excuse me, where mothers' work hours uh, changed during the pandemic, we consider a, a couple of different comparisons here. First, we compare mothers who worked full-time prior to the pandemic, but who experienced divergent patterns during the pandemic. We find that more privileged mothers in regard to race and family income were more likely to pull back on work hours early in the pandemic. We also find that mothers who uh, were unable to work from home, who had school-aged children, who were more stressed, and who were already doing more of the housework and childcare were also more likely to pull back on their work hours. Mothers who were already primarily responsible for childcare may have prioritized their children early in the pandemic by either choosing to leave their jobs if their family could afford it, or feeling as though they had no choice um, if they were unable to work from home and manage children's schooling. In contrast, mothers were more likely to remain employed full time if they could work from home and if they were essential workers. Focusing on mothers who worked part-time prior to the pandemic, uh, we see that they were more likely to remain in part-time work if they were more educated, worked from home more frequently, were an essential worker, were less stressed, and did fewer shares of housework and childcare. So similar to the findings for mothers who worked full-time, access to workplace and family supports increased the likelihood that part-time working mothers maintain their attachment to paid work. So as Dan mentioned, uh, I don't think any of us thought we would still be talking about you know, the effects of the pandemic as it is ongoing uh, three years later. Um, and it has certainly been a long road um, and one that has cost countless lives, numerous jobs, significant mental health issues and learning losses for children. Uh, although the costs have been immense, uh, there are opportunities to learn from what happened to work toward a better society. Our goal with the SBDLC and this symposium is to use the information from our study and insights from others here today to really identify strategies, practices, policies that we can use to work toward a better, more equitable society moving forward. And so we identify uh, four lessons from our study um, on things that we can do to advance gender equality in the future. First, father's remote work uh, was a key predictor of both domestic labor and mother's employment. Fathers increasingly express a desire to be more engaged at home, but cite workplace barriers as preventing them from doing so. By having greater access uh, to remote work during the pandemic, fathers likely were more exposed to domestic tasks, had more time to participate in these tasks, and reduced burdens on mothers as a result. Uh, interestingly, mothers also do more domestic labor when they have workplace flexibility, so it's simply increasing workplace flexibility seems to be a double-edged sword. Uh, we suspect that this largely has to do with broader gender and workplace norms, which encourage mothers to use work family policies for domestic tasks while stigmatizing fathers for doing the same thing. To overcome this, we need to shift expectations surrounding work and care by providing equal access to work family policies for mothers and fathers, as well as incentivizing fathers to use these policies. In doing so, we can increase father's time at home while also changing cultural attitudes about gendered work and care responsibilities. Given the importance of fathers' remote work uh, for our findings, uh, we did look at trajectories of fathers' remote work during the pandemic. As we know, access to remote work has, has increased and remained elevated for some, but not all workers. Uh, we find that fathers who were able to maintain the ability to work from home uh, were more educated, had higher incomes, and were more likely to have schedule flexibility prior to the pandemic. White fathers were also more likely to consistently work from home than black fathers. So taken together, this suggests uh, that increased access to remote work was disproportionately concentrated among more advantaged families. To broaden the benefits of remote work, access to remote work needs to extend beyond high salaried professional occupations and become more accessible to diverse families. Uh, we also recognize that not everyone can work from home, and so increased access to remote work, to remote work must be used in combination with other policy recommendations uh, to advance gender equality more broadly. The second lesson from our study is the importance of supports for mothers' labor force participation. Greater domestic and family supports enabled mothers to maintain their attachment to paid work, uh, whereas as those supports uh, started to come back, fathers actually reduced um, their domestic involvement as a result. Uh, taken together, it's vital that we acknowledge that the care crisis existed prior to the pandemic and that the pandemic only exacerbated this crisis. 
we need to increase both structural supports and father involvement and not simply substitute one for the other. This means expanding access to affordable childcare, reducing uh, our focus on, on virtual learning, and expanding access to before and after school programs. Substantial financial and cultural investments in care are needed, and we need these investments to come from both the government and fathers uh, to reduce domestic burdens on mothers and promote greater attachment to the labor force. To illustrate the impact of father's domestic support on mother's employment, here we show the association between father's shares of childcare prior to the pandemic and changes in mother's employment early in the pandemic. In families where mothers did all of the childcare prior to the pandemic, they had a 50% probability of reducing their paid labor force participation during the lockdown period. In contrast, when mothers and fathers equally shared childcare, mothers had only a 15% probability of reducing their paid labor force participation. Quite simply, enabling and encouraging fathers to perform more domestic labor can have dramatic effects on mother's labor force attachment. The third lesson we highlight is the persistent impact of stress and worry about COVID on mother's employment. Declines in mental health have been well documented, and we must recognize the toll that these stresses have taken on mothers in particular. Mothers remain primarily responsible for decisions about family health, and many mothers reduce their labor force participation to minimize risks to their family. Stress remains elevated and nearly half of mothers remain worried about COVID. We need a more unified public health approach to minimize virus transmission and reduce the burdens on individual families. Seasonal spikes in flu, RSV, COVID, and other viruses may have similar negative impacts on mother's employment moving forward, making it essential to invest in policies that lessen mother's fears, reduce stress, and increase access to mental health services and interventions. To give you a sense of the impact of stress and COVID worries on mother's employment, here we show the strong link between these factors during the pandemic. Not surprisingly, mothers who were more worried about COVID were more stressed, but more importantly, we find that nearly 87% of mothers remained employed during the pandemic when stress and worry was low, but this drops to only 67% of mothers being employed when stress and worry about COVID was high. Concerted efforts to reduce mother's stress and fears about COVID and other viruses are essential to keeping mothers in the labor force. And finally, just as fathers' participation in domestic labor enabled mothers to mean attachment to paid work, parents were more likely to shift to a more permanent, non-traditional division of domestic labor when mothers were employed, and particularly when they were not working remotely. To increase mothers' attachment to the labor force, employers need to actively retain employed mothers and develop strategies to recruit mothers back to work. Employers need to be mindful of how pandemic-related gaps in employment are viewed and recognize that these employment gaps may be due to the structural changes we illustrate and thus should not be viewed negatively. Return to work, mentorship, and career development programs are vital for mother's successful long-term re-entry into paid work. We provide just one example uh, to illustrate this. So looking at the trajectories of housework previously shown, we see that in families uh, where mothers were not employed prior to the pandemic, it was highly likely that they maintained a traditional division of housework during the pandemic. In contrast, in families where mothers were employed full-time prior to the pandemic, it was much more likely that they followed the pandemic changers or non-traditional trajectories of housework. As such, enacting strategies to recruit and retain mothers in paid labor can promote greater gender equality. So in conclusion, we examined three years of data to understand changes in parents' divisions of labor, identified key factors that led to these changes, and used this information to formulate recommendations on ways to work toward greater gender equality moving forward. But this is only the start of the conversation. We look forward to hearing from and working with policymakers and legislators, activists and business leaders and other academics about strategies to use the knowledge gained during the pandemic to work toward greater, and greater gender equality moving forward. Thank you. All right, so Richard and Pam, we've got some questions. Do we have time for a few questions? Um, do we know, has the congressman arrived? Oh, he's here, okay. Okay, great. All right, so we'll just take a few questions. All right, so we've got, we've got a bunch of questions that have come in. Um, you know, we'll just get to a few of them. Uh, so someone is asking, geographically, how did these changes play out? You know, urban versus rural? Um, you know, and then can you talk a little bit more about, um, you know, any other kind of differences, uh, race, income, and education level that you found in the data? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, geographically, we have respondents from 48 out of the 50 states. 
Um, and to be honest, uh, we, we have not sort of analyzed geographic variations uh, much. Um, we did look extensively, uh, particularly early in the pandemic, the shifts that we saw, you know, the most dramatic shifts toward a more equal division of domestic labor, those patterns existed across socio-demographic categories. Uh, so across racial and ethnic groups, across levels of education, across you know, essential worker status, various types of employment, um, it, was, it was very consistent that parents sort of shifted uh, to a more uh, non-traditional division of domestic labor early in the pandemic. As we look sort of more long term, um, we have started to see some changes um, by socio-demographic groups. Um, you know, I noted, uh, you know, the changes in remote work have been largely sort of concentrated among more advantaged families. So, you know, remote work popped up a lot as being important in facilitating greater gender equality. And so, you know, it's, it, I think it's fair for us to assume that more advantaged families in regard to race, income, and education have been, you know, sort of the, the beneficiaries um, of those kinds of changes. So while we, you know, cautiously paint an optimistic picture, you know, on, on some levels, we recognize that progress has been uneven and continues to be uneven. Um, and so we really need to recognize and work toward uh, strategies that can um, enable less advantaged families, families who do not have the same access to, to remote work, to affordable childcare, um, to, to all of these sorts of things, you know, to really sort of, of help them um, more so. Okay. Cool. Um, uh, so a couple, one other question, and then we'll, we'll get to the next panel. Um, we've got another question that says, is it time to let go of the work-life balance phraseology? Paid work, childcare, housework is all work and all life. The labeling feels gendered and outdated. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people in this room um, have moved on from using that phrasing. I think, um, Katie Collins' uh, depiction of this as a work-family justice um, issue is, is perhaps more apropos and, and something that a lot of us are moving towards um, and thinking about. Um, you know, the, the notion of balance, and I think you know maybe uh, Kathleen will talk about this later, right? Suggests that that we can have everything that we want, right? That that we can have it all. Um, that we can be the ideal employee and also be carers. Um, but truth be told, right, time is finite. And, um, you know, we, especially, you know, when it comes to work, um, sometimes are asked to do much more um, than what our caregiving responsibilities uh, would um, allow us. Um, and so we have to forsake different things in our lives. So this notion of balance, right? I think again portends this notion that 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 you know that we're ignoring these cultural contradictions with respect to what uh, our paces of employment employment demand of us, and also what our families need from us. Um, and so we really need to start thinking about this in terms of you know how can we empower people um, to to devote their energies where they feel they're most important. Um, and so, you know, again, maybe changing the way in which we phrase this and think about it was going to be helpful, right, in, in, in moving towards that. I think we have time for one last question. Um, you know, and this is, um, um, uh, you know, asking about, you know, will we be delving into the, how the pandemic affected transgender, nonconforming individuals? Um, you know, and, and then anything about, um, like, long COVID, um, you know, that kind of, um, that very invisible kind of um, uh, uh, research, you know, is there re any research, um, you know, into kind of how the, the, the sort of the long tail of the pandemic is continuing? Yeah, um, so with respect to, um, you know, non binary folks or people who are LGBTQ. Uh, we have some in our sample, you know, we did not limit our study uh, to those in different sex partnerships. Um, but it's really hard for us to look at those groups individually just because the numbers are, are so small. Um, you know, but the NCHAT study, 
which I don't know why I was sitting here promoting someone else's work, <laughs> um, you know, is you know, uh, NSF funded and was designed to look um, uh, in particular at what is going on in gay and lesbian couples and, and those who are you know, genderqueer or non-binary. Um, so, and they've been producing some excellent work in that area, so I recommend um, whoever had that question to, to look into to the results from, from, from those analyses. Um, with respect to long COVID. We don't have any questions about long COVID. Uh, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but we can't ask everything. But I, I mean, I do think it plays into the worry and the stress story. Um, I think part of the reason why worry about COVID is so high is because no one knows what the long-term effect of COVID is, right? I think everyone knows someone or has had it themselves, right? And, and, and most people get over it okay. And so, you know, is it any different than other viruses? Well, it is for a lot of people. And I think that's why people remain more worried about COVID than they are the cold or the flu or anything like that. Um, and so I can't sort of definitively say that, but I strongly suspect that that is a big reason why we see rates of worry um, and stress levels continue to be elevated. Okay. And I would just add that it's also why we need to continue to focus on attending to those concerns, right? Vaccines are not the solution for our public health problems in total, right? We need a more comprehensive approach. There remains families that are at risk with immunocompromised loved ones or themselves who have long COVID that affects their ability to work. You know, we cannot just move on from this. We have not moved on from this. We are still in this. Um, and so, you know, that question goes right to the heart of, of you know, the, the worry about COVID and its centrality um, to the changes that occurred um, during the pandemic and are likely to continue to have impacts for a lot of families. All right. Well, thank you so much. You. Round of applause. Everyone, this is uh, Representative Ro Khanna uh, from California, and I'm realizing that I don't have your bio with me. All right, and I uh, apologize. I have your bio somewhere, oh, and it's not here. Th those are usually waste of a lot of time anyway, so we well, can just about, get to the conversation. Oh, let's get you, yeah, and then in the conversation, then you can tell, you can, you, you can give us your bona fides, which I, I'm sure, sure we don't need. <laughs> So, uh, Congressman, one of the reasons that we really wanted to talk with you today, uh, we're here talking about gender equality and we're talking about um, what needs to happen to advance gender equality. Um, you know, World Economic Forum says we're centuries away from true uh, parity or, or economic equality. Um, and we're talking about what needs to change in public policy, in um, business practice, in cultural attitudes. And when I came across your economic patriotism agenda, I was reading about it, uh, and in the same breath that you talk about, you know, uh, everything that you would imagine in industrial policy, investing in manufacturing and chips, you in the same breath talk about paid family leave and childcare, and you talk about them as economic issues as part of economic patriotism. So can you tell us a little bit about your economic patriotism agenda and where family supportive policies that have generally been seen as social policies, how they fit into an economic and industrial policy. Sure, well first of all, thank you for having me. What an important topic, particularly on uh, Women's History Month. Uh, I'll start with, you know, women helped industrialize America. I mean, FDR's New Deal, all of the women were in the factories. I mean, that was Rosie the Riveter. So this idea that industrial policy uh, isn't linked to gender equality uh, is, is just false. In fact, when I was with the president in Ohio, I was one of the authors of the Chips and Science Act, uh, one of the points I made to Governor DeWine about the Intel factories is you can't have abortion laws uh, restrictive uh, and banning abortion after six weeks and expect people from my district to show up and work in those factories or to expect people uh, to want to send their daughters or sons to college. So if you're thinking about uh, in Ohio. Um, so if you're thinking about uh, what is uh, a effective policy, industrial policy that has the workforce, you have to think about gender equality. One of the points of that, and, and Gina Raimondo I think has done an excellent job on uh, implementing CHIPS with childcare, is that you need childcare policy so that we can have people uh, who want to 
uh, to work, but also want to make sure that uh, their kids are being taken uh, care of, uh, have that option. And the reality is that uh, childcare is still disproportionately falls on women. I mean, that's changing, but it's the, the truth. And so having childcare uh, is essential if we want to tap all of the talent and resources. And we're working on a bail modeled after uh, the Canadian model to have childcare at, at $10 uh, a day capped at that uh, for working and middle class families. And this will actually help unleash the, uh, the talent, the potential uh, for contributing to our economy. So I want to get to that, but you, you mentioned a, a Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, and just this past, in the last few days, the Biden administration has come out with um, their new industrial policy, you know, tens of millions of dollars uh, for the semiconductor industry with the proviso that they also provide childcare. So the question there, you know, there's been a long um, reluctance to have the government involved in sort of family issues. So is this a change? Do you see this as a change, uh, you know, in, in terms of government role? Um, you know, uh, that's sort of one part of the question. The other is we've also got a system where we have private health care. You know, is, or, or, or is this sort of starting down a slippery slope of child care then being come, becoming tied to uh, private employers? Um, or is this sort of the best that we can do to kind of get started on something where there's been so little movement for yeah. decades? Both are excellent questions. Well, one of the idea, I mean, as one of the original authors of the Chips and Science Act uh, with Senator Schumer, it was very important for us to have conditionality. And that means if we're going to provide government financing to a company to build new factories, they have to adhere to certain standards. They can't use that money for stock buybacks. And uh, we made that clear to Gina Raimondo when we were uh, discussing with the administration the, uh, the implementation of this. And uh, to the administration's credit, they said that they would deprioritize companies that engaged in any stock buybacks. They have to invest in the United States. They have to have prevailing wage, and they have to treat families well. That was uh, the intent of those of us who drafted the legislation. So I think what Secretary Raimondo is doing is uh, implementing the intent of Congress, which came with very clear conditions. And these conditions are new. They're, I mean, this is where I talked about FDR. If you go study uh, the New Deal, it, that, there were tremendous conditions to the financing of private sector uh, industrialization. There were conditions uh, around prevailing wage. There were conditions around unionization. There were conditions about racial integration. Uh, we probably weren't uh, as advanced on gender equality, so I'm not sure if there were conditions on that back then. I, there are probably New Deal scholars who would know that better. But the idea of conditionality uh, has been true in American history. And the idea of the government playing a role in industry has been true since Hamilton. I mean, this is what built the Hamilton American system and what built uh, us post-World War II. Now, I do think we have to move to universal child care, and we can't just rely on conditionality uh, in these cases of government uh, assistance. Uh, so while I applaud what Secretary Raimondo is doing, I don't think that that's a substitute for what people like Elizabeth Warren have been calling for for years, which is universal child care in this country. So let's talk about your proposal now about universal child care. As many people in this, uh, you know, scholars in this room know, uh, the United States uh, spends about, you know, among the, the least of all OECD countries uh, in child care. Um, you know, we really don't have a care infrastructure, which the pandemic made so brutally clear. Uh, so uh, tell us more about your plan and how do we go from going through a pandemic and, and still not getting child care or, or investment, say, in Build Back Better, that all fell through. How do we go from, you know, from where we are now to uh, a system which, at $10 a day, with hopefully good care wages for people who work in early care and education, how do we get there? Um, how do you build that coalition of support for that kind of investment? Well, we get there, I think, by... Uh by being simple in how we explain it. That's why I like this idea of uh, no middle class and working class family should pay more than $10 a day and we should have a $20 wage floor for people who are providing childcare. Uh, and if you have a bill structured like that where you get the grants to the states, the states then can contract with 
uh, child care providing agencies that meet a threshold of quality. They can be public or private, uh, and you pay uh, $20 wages for the child care workers, and you say that if you're making under 400000 no one should be paying more than $10. That's the threshold uh, outline of the plan. I have great respect for what the President was trying to do and build back better, and I have a tremendous admiration for Elizabeth Warren, who's the champion on that. But a lot of their plans are linked to percentage of income, and I think that makes uh, intellectual sense. I think it's a harder uh, message to get across. I think what Canada has done in saying, look, uh, $10 a day, uh, that's what the cost should be uh, for families. Now, one of the things that we're discussing with groups, and I'd be curious for your or others' input, is whether to have an opt-out provision uh, for those who don't want that and are stay-at-home dads or stay-at-home moms or have their grandparents uh, looking after their kids, whether they get some stipend, $300 a month, $400 a month, if they are uh, middle and working class income. That would help us get more conservatives on board because they often are saying, well, what about parents who are home with the kids or who have their grandparents? And that's something that, of course, we need the broad coalition that we're actually trying to work through uh, and would help us get to, to the votes for universal child care. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about workplace policy. As uh, Richard and Dan were talking about, um, you know, finding that when there is schedule control, I don't want to say flexibility because for a lot of low-wage workers, there's too much flexibility. They don't have, you know, right. zero contracts or they, you know, zero hours contracts. They don't have enough hours or they don't have predictable schedules. So when you have schedule control that gives you amount of uh, say over when, where, and how you work, you know, across the board, whether you're a desk knowledge worker or uh, you know, a low-wage hourly worker, um, you know, that that makes a huge difference for um, women to be able to stay in the workforce. It makes a huge difference for men or people of all genders to be able to uh, be more present and be uh, more active in care and caregiving roles, which, as you rightly point out, still is still tends to fall largely on women. You know, um, other countries have things like right to request flexible work. They have other kind of government policies or... Um, states like Oregon have um, stable schedules laws. Uh, what role do you think uh, government or policy should play in, uh, in, in sort of nudging workplaces to actually adopt the kinds of policies or what kind of role should government play to have the policies that would create those workplaces that would promote gender equality? Well, at a very basic, we certainly need to start with paid family leave so that if people have uh, obligations with their family uh, in terms of uh, health issues, in terms of mental health issues, uh, th that they can take that. You know, I read somewhere, shockingly, uh, that uh, one in three teenage girls have contemplated suicide mm. at some point. Now, some of that is because of social media in my district, but it, it may not just be a paid family leave for a obvious medical condition. Someone may be having a very rough day and people may benefit from staying at home. Uh, and that is something we need to do. Then I think we need flexibility. Look, today I uh, don't do it often, but uh, I had to run to the school because uh, my, my son didn't have his school bag. No, I didn't have any consequences that I was a little bit late. Many people, if they have to do that, there would be consequences uh, at their work. And so how do we have uh, laws that have accommodation, not just, okay, you're sick, but uh, I have a dentist appointment for my kid, or I have a medical appointment, or I had to do something to, to go to see their uh, teacher, or a lot of things that people in more privileged positions take for granted, that mm -hmm. we can, yes, we have busy schedules, but we have a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, not having those consequences, and how do you have legislation for that? Uh, I think not enough time has been played on developing that because we don't even have the paid family leave for the crisis situations. Mm -hmm. Uh, but both of those, I think, are, are critical. To some extent, the remote work model uh, it, it was embraced by folks because uh, it did provide some of this uh, increased flexibility. Uh, and the question is, can some of those practices be codified uh, in terms of flexibility and, uh, and we have laws around them? And do you think that's a direction that government should go? Yes, I do. I, I, I think we, but we've got to start basically on paid family leave. It was very frustrating to those of us in the House of Representatives that we did not get paid family leave uh, in 
uh, in the legislation last Congress. And that was because that's just the basic. Uh, but beyond that, I think that we, there should be a conversation about uh, some amount of family time flexibility that you, you don't have to provide a rationale, but it's it just if you care about uh, doing things for your family or your kids or your relatives, uh, that you have that flexibility and, and don't have that consequence. And, you know, technically a party, the Republicans would say they're pro-family should be for some of these, these policies uh, and who care about parents being more involved in their kids' education. Uh, but they're not even right now for paid, uh, paid family leave, which is the starter, in my view, to, to these conversations. So how do we get there? You know, I mean, that's the, that's the question. I, you know, people in this room have been researching this for decades. It's been something that advocates have been calling for for decades. It is a floor. The United States, I think, in the event that we had last week, along with Papua New Guinea and a handful of Pacific Islands, we're the only ones that do not guarantee paid maternity leave, which, yep. you know, people have said is nothing short of cruel. Um, so how do we move from where we are and, and sort of the, the stalemate? How do we actually get to that very baseline of paid family leave and getting that passed? I think we have to move the conversation beyond what is just, uh, what is rights-based to what is going to make the economy strong. Uh, a lot of our conversation, understandably, has focused on uh, racial equality, gender equality, racial and gender justice. I think those are things that are deeply held values, but that are also uh, values that are uh, highly uh, charged in our political environment. But when we begin the conversation by saying, look, we've got about 330 billion people here. We're competing with countries with billions of, uh, over a billion people. We're losing out on our industry. We know that women are, 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 are leading and are graduating in a lot of uh, important fields. We can't uh, lose talented people in our workforce and expect to be the strongest manufacturing superpower, the strongest uh, innovation economy. Uh, and we also have to support families. And so that these policies are common sense to building a strong American economy, and they're common sense in terms of being pro-family. And if we start with that, I think we can build a broader coalition. That doesn't mean that we don't uh, understand the, the value of these intrinsically as policies of uh, equal opportunity and justice. But I think that the language of economic growth and the law, language of uh, something being pro-family may help us build a broader coalition. Mm. So uh, we've got a number of questions coming in that I want to make sure we have Good. time for. But before I go to them, I want to ask you for any kind of closing thoughts that you might have and if you have any calls to action for anyone here in the room or uh, who are watching us online either now or later because with the virtual world this will live. Well, I appreciate, uh, I, I appreciate your convening here. I would, uh, I, I would say that uh, on, the, on, on child care, uh, paid family leave, please uh, continue to advocate for that. It was one of the big disappointments for many of us in the House uh, in the last two years of Congress. We got a lot done on climate. We have got a lot done on, uh, on some of the industrial policy, on infrastructure. Uh, but we did not get a lot done on things like child care, paid family leave, universal preschool. Uh, and, and that was a big miss, especially during after the pandemic, when we know that uh, part of the uh, the, the, the quote unquote worker shortage was uh, women who weren't entering the workforce. Uh, those were economic policies uh, and they didn't get done. So please keep these up uh, high up in the priority. I just was at a Congressional Progressive Caucus meeting yesterday. We were discussing the top three priorities. Our breakout group put child care up in the top three, but it matters to hear from folks uh, in terms of what the focus of the party will be. And second, let's start thinking about how we make uh, the economic argument. Uh, there's a rights-based case to be made for policies. There's a rights-based case to be made that, uh, you know, the Indian American community, uh, someone of Hindu faith, should be able to be in public service. But there is also a case that's not just rights-based, and that case is that, th that this is not asking for uh, something uh, that's going to in any way hurt America. This is something we desperately need for America, that we're lo losing so much talent. 
we're losing our productive capability. We're losing our ability to compete with China and other countries if we don't have these policies. Uh, and these policies actually are going to be what makes America strong uh, and prosperous and wealthy. And in, in general, I think the Democrats need to talk more about that. That's uh, how FDR won four terms. He, it wasn't just social justice. It was this is what's going to make America a strong, prosperous economy. All right. Um, let me get to some of these questions. Thank you so much for that closing, stirring closing uh, call to action. Um, so it says here, uh, and also for, yeah, yay for childcare. <laughs> yay for all of the things that we've been working on here. Uh, thank you for highlighting the ongoing risk and stress of COVID, long COVID, and acknowledging we need much more than vaccines to protect us all. Um, uh, and then it says, if we're paying workers $20 an hour, uh, and then families are paying $10 an hour for childcare. How do these businesses afford all their costs? Is this government subsidies? It is, it's government financing uh, that helps uh, working families. I mean, how do you uh, afford public school? How do we afford to pay teachers? We should pay teachers more, but how do we afford that as a society? I would say that that is a, a social a public good and having uh, a child care for, for kids, particularly till they get to the public school, is a social and public good. Uh, and that is something that uh, we should be willing to pay taxes for. I mean, we've made plenty of billions of dollars in my district. I've got $10 trillion that I've said, tax these folks, and they're fine. They keep sending me back to Congress. We could tax them and have child care for everyone. <laughs> I love that. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. It's wonderful to have you here. And um, we will um, send out some of the articles that you've, read, you've written about um, uh, child care as part of economic patriotism and your bio that I so neglectfully forgot to start off with. We'll include that in the email that we send out to all of the participants. So thank, thank you. you so much thank for you your for time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for so much. It was wonderful. Thank you. So, so during the pandemic, right from the from the very beginning, our life was totally disrupted. We went from being out of the home to just being at home all the time. And so my wife and I both shifted our businesses to working remotely and we shifted uh, you know, our kids' education to, to remote learning. And that was um, just such a such a big disruption. We felt like we were, knew what we were doing beforehand and then all of a sudden everything had changed and so uh, it certainly led to an incredible amount of stress and and tension and worry and, and you know not only uh, regarding you know sort of the larger events of what was happening in the world but certainly in our own home of just like how do we adjust everything that we were used to doing we were no longer doing and we were having to figure out on the fly how to work remotely, how to take care of uh, the people who we served in our businesses and how to provide sort of uh, simple things like food uh, for our children. And um, so it was, it was just as if everything overnight had changed and it was incredibly um, difficult to adjust to. So, so since so since March 2020, a lot has um, changed. I think that certainly the beginning of the pandemic really forced us to have to confront a lot of issues, a lot of tasks and responsibilities. We were having conversations around unseen labor, around things that um, you know often would by default get. Um, completed and handled by my wife. And so certainly by being together, um, things like taking care of the kids, about like helping the kids, whether it's with their academics or whether it was physical activity, whether it was cooking, cleaning, doing the laundry, all of these things, 
um, we really figured out how to communicate more openly and effectively about who was doing what. And while I believe that over the years, it sort of continues to fluctuate, like who is exactly doing what, um, we've been able to just be much more intentional and open about having these conversations. And it's not perfect. Communication has been sort of like the main takeaway. All of a sudden, 2020 happened. The pandemic happened. And I had to make a choice. Do I protect myself and my son or do I go to work? Do I risk the safety of my clients or do I keep them at home making sure that I do all the, the risky things which should have never been a risk at first? Because now going shopping during 2020 could have been a, a death sentence. It was very borderline depressing because we would find ourselves priced out of Seattle, losing our home, having to move to a different city. I would have to make very big cutbacks on what we could and could not do because we didn't have the finances for it anymore. I, Even to this day, I now rely on food banks because I'm still digging out of that hole from not being able to work, not being able to have, you know, that guarantee stable paycheck. Now that we're coming out of it, we're still we still have the title of essential workers, but all we're getting is a hand clap. So I've learned many things over the past three years. And my family is one of the families that COVID touched. We lost seven people. And if I, if I can't take anything else away, I learned that life is precious. Life is precious. And we all have to realize that we can't just care for ourselves. We have to take care of our most vulnerable people. Their life is just as precious. Our senior citizens, their lives are just as precious because they're the ones that paved the way for us. During the pandemic, um, my job changed in that, you know, of course we were considered essential workers um, as, as a nurse. Um, so, you know, I was almost expected or required to go to work um, and not miss, and I normally don't miss work. Richard did then was able to stay home um, which was good for us, but he basically then had to do everything. Um, I worked my three days a week. I was part-time actually before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, I went full-time, um, basically worked a bunch of extra days. Sometimes I would work four days a week. Um, and sometimes it was required and sometimes it was voluntary, but there were times that there were mandatory overtime. When the pandemic hit in March, I was moved to work from home solely. Uh, Melissa, of course, being a nurse, worked long weeks and would work up to 80 hours a week, depending on how busy it was. So I became the basically the full sitter for my kids. So I stayed home, worked at home, and then took care of the kids specifically. She worked long hours as a nurse. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I do choose to do that, but I do work a lot of 16 hour shifts. Um, it's almost easier for me just to stay at work. Um, and so then I would get home and sometimes I would work the next day. So I would get home around 11 to midnight and then go to work at um, seven the next morning. I do the brunt of the housework. Um, she does help out for sure when she is home on her days off, uh, but I am kind of the, the sole childcare provider for my kids at this point, so. We found out that our daughter has autism or um, somewhere on the spectrum, not quite sure yet. Um, uh, so we she started with a sensory modulation disorder and then um, now we've gotten the official diagnosis from a medical professional that she does have that. Um, so in so doing, she is a lot of um, picks up a lot of Richard's time um, and she loves Richard like Richard is her rock and really like takes care of her really well. My name is Vicki Shabo, and I'm Senior Fellow for Paid Leave Policy and Strategy here at the Better Life Lab at New America. Um, and I'm really excited to welcome this panel. Um, you know, we've heard a lot today about how families changed, how work changed, what we need to do moving forward. Um, so much to consider about people's lived experiences and what the implications are for policy and for practice. Um, lots to consider as we can, as we think about what is the scaffolding that we need to create a strong economy, that we need to create strong families, and that we need to level the playing field so that we don't continue to live in a country where people are playing the boss lottery, or playing the geography lottery, or playing any other number of lotteries that create huge disparities in circumstances and inequalities, not just in current experiences today, but in the implications for children and for families and for retirement security, and for gender equity, and for business strength, and for everything else in the long run. Um, it's International Women's Day, so uh, we celebrate that. We celebrate Women's History Month, but we also take stock of where we've been and recognize that we're at an inflection point. Um, we've, we've all come through a very transformational experience in one way or another, and the, the pandemic affected all of us in different ways. Um, there are some silver linings, and there are a lot of things to reflect on and consider about how we create a stronger country going forward. Um, it feels to me, and I think to, to many of us, like narratives and expectations are shifting, and yet we are stuck in a political moment where only a little bit has changed, where we've made nudges, um, the American Rescue Plan, the Infrastructure Bill, uh, the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, are all really important steps forward, and yet there's so much more to do. Um, the care economy in particular is the great unfinished business of this moment. The House passed transformational policies on paid family and medical leave, on child care, and on home and community-based services, and yet all of that was left on the cutting room floor when the Senate considered what to do um, at the hands of two Democratic senators and 50 Republicans. And so uh, here we are uh, at this moment as we head into a, a moment of more policymaking, lots of conversations about deficit reduction and trimming, trimming um, core programs when we know that there are a lot of places where we need to expand. Um, we're waiting for the president's budget, which comes out tomorrow, and hopefully we'll have a renewed commitment to huge investments in things like child care, home care, and paid family and medical leave. Um, you know, there was a little bit to celebrate, a lot to celebrate actually at the end of the year with the passage of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and the PUMP Act, which provided new protections for pregnant workers and for breastfeeding parents in the workplace. Uh, but there's so much more to do. Um, women's rights, obviously, this particular International Women's Day um, are really on the chopping block with respect to Dobbs. So there's lots for us to, to noodle over here as we think about where to go. So I am excited to introduce the panel. Um, and we were supposed to be joined today by another panelist, Yvette Legual, who is a worker here in DC. She unfortunately had a family death and needed to leave the country. But I want to just touch on her experience before we turn to these, these panelists, because it really does speak to so much of what was in Richard and Dan's presentation. Um, Yvette is a mom. Uh, she had a child before the pandemic. She had a child during the pandemic. She was a frontline healthcare worker at a community health center here in DC. 
um, in our conversations with her prior to you know, when she was planning to be part of this conversation, she told us about the fear of going to work every day, the unpredictable hours that she dealt with, the, um, the contagion that happened despite the, the carefulness um, of her work setting. She was testing patients for COVID before there were vaccines. She had several scares and needed to quarantine. Um, she had her second child during the pandemic and was able to use the eight weeks that DC provided for paid family leave, which she said wasn't enough and happily is getting, has been expanded to 12 weeks since then. Um, but it still wasn't enough. Um, her, her husband was also on the front lines of the pandemic. He needed to be at work. She was doing most of the caregiving at home as well as working her job and it became too much. And she ultimately, after her parental leave returned, there was another health scare and it was just too much. And so she is one of the people who's left the workforce and is trying to figure out what to do next. So um, that is a very short, short summary of, of her conversation. And one of the things that she said when I asked her what would have made a difference, she said child care, more paid leave, paid sick leave, and norms around gender equitable caregiving so that her husband would have felt more comfortable providing equal care at home um, so that she could have shared the load better. So with that, um, I'm really excited to turn to this panel. To my immediate left is Sophia Mitchell. Um, she's a policy attorney at the First Shift Justice Project, which is a local nonprofit organization uh, here in DC, a legal organization with a mission to help working parents assert their workplace rights to prevent job loss. At First Shift, Sophia advocates for improvements to the DC Paid Family Leave Program and other laws and programs impacting working families in the district. Um, to Sophia's left is my good friend, Julie Cashin, who's the Director of Economic Justice at the Century Foundation. She has expertise in the care agenda, economic mobility, and labor. Um, she has more than two decades of experience working on these issues in federal and state government and through the nonprofit sector, including working for uh, the late Ted Kennedy, Governor John Corzine of New Jersey, the Make It Work Campaign, and the domestic work, National Domestic Workers Alliance and others. Um, and then to Julie's left is Shonda Causer, the executive director of Main Street Alliance, um, a national organization of small business owners working to advance a circular economy. Shonda has extensive work experience in for-profit and not-for-profit organizations like SEIU, Honest Tea, and the Leadership for Educational Equity. And as an executive coach, she's worked with burgeoning executives to season leaders to support strategy management and overall confidence in leadership. This variety of work experience helps her to think through processes from different angles effectively. So we have a rich, a rich discussion planned here, um, and we hope to make those very interactive and to have some time for Q&A. Just a reminder, uh, if you're in the room, scan the QR code to, to send questions, and if you're online, send questions through the internet. Um, so I'm gonna turn first to Sophia. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I love First Ship Justice. I used to be on your board, which was great pleasure to work with Laura and see your organization grow. Um, as someone who's been working on these issues in the context of low-wage workers, I'm wondering if you can tell us, um, you know, you, you and First Shift work with a lot of workers like Yvette who have been managing work and family and health concerns and implicit bias and ex explicit discrimination. I'm, I'm sure you've heard stories from clients at First Shift, and I'm wondering if you can just share some with us. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me. I'm so thrilled to be a part of such a timely conversation. And I'm so, um, I'm sorry Yvette couldn't be with us, but I'm glad that we started with her story because I think it highlights a really important part of the work and care conversation, which is while having paid leave is really important, workers have ongoing caregiving needs beyond their paid leave from work. So when returning to work, workers may wonder what options or protections they may have when they have exhausted all of their paid leave. And a lot of that, unfortunately, is up to their employer. So some employers acknowledge family responsibilities and may, for example, allow you to leave 30 minutes early to pick up your child from work or daycare, or excuse me, school or daycare, or uh, work from home when there are last minute changes to your child care arrangements. However, when you do not have a employer who is flexible, you have, you're left with very limited options and legal protections. However, I want to note that there are some laws and policies that can support continuing caregiving needs. I know earlier we talked about predictable scheduling, and there are a number of cities and states that have predictable scheduling laws, which provide uh, workers in the retail, hospitality, and food service industry with more stable scheduling, and some of these laws even include a specific carve out for a right to request a change to schedule to accommodate caregiving leaves. There's also paid sick leave, which um, provides workers with time off to care for themselves or uh, a loved one. And some of these jurisdictions even uh, have a 
you're allowed to use paid leave to attend things like parent-teacher conferences or if your child, uh, your child care is uh, impacted by a public health order. There are also less obvious ways to support caregiving, like ensuring that child care and caregiving responsibilities are a basis for a reasonable accommodation for individuals experiencing domestic violence. Last year, we had a client who I'll call Louise, who was experiencing domestic violence and came to us seeking legal assistance after being terminated from her job. Louise informed her employer that she was experiencing domestic violence and requested an adjustment to her schedule to attend her court dates, meet with her social worker, and care for her young daughter. After leaving her abuser, Louise was staying at hotels and domestic violence shelters, and she needed to be available to care for her daughter in the afternoons. Instead of granting the scheduling adjustment and giving her a morning shift, Louise's employer reduced her work hours and told our client that her daughter, um, to bring her daughter to work with her. She complied with these instructions because she had no choice. However, on the third day that she brought her daughter to work with her, Louise was terminated for unspecified reasons. So this year we advocated for, to include the direct acknowledgement of child care needs and adjustments to child care arrangements to be added to the reasonable accommodation to empower domestic violence survivors to request reasonable accommodations that allow them to address the broad range of issues that they deal with as they seek to get their lives back on track and maintain employment. So while policies may assist in addressing care caregiving needs, what is really needed is a culture change within the workplace that centers caregiving in the absence of a child care infrastructure in our country. Yeah, listening to you, um, I mean, DC has done a lot in terms of putting laws on the books, um, but you still have situations like Louise's or Yvette's or many others where there's just this day-to-day -day tension and there's a broader lack of awareness from employers about the needs, and we'll talk to Shonda about the employer perspective in a second um, or in a, in a few minutes, but you know, what, do you, what do you think and what is First Shift doing in terms of the, the education and outreach to employers and to other stakeholders in the community to try to make sure that you know, policy can play a particular role, but what else do we need to do to try to make sure that the promises of policy are real? Yeah, so I think we're in a very unique and special position at First Shift because we provide legal services, we do policy advocacy, we do continued education. So we're able to you know, identify issues like this from that individual client is, is experiencing and then move from there all within you know, the same workplace. You know, I speak to my colleagues, they inform me of this thing that is going on and we you know, together brainstorm what the next step should be. So that's been really great. I think also with specifically with the Paid Family Leave Program, the continued advocacy from the DC Paid Family Leave Coalition. Um, you know, they worked to pass the law, but you know, now that's passed, or you know, years ago, there's still work to improve the law, so that has been great. Thank you. Um, so moving, yeah, from the, from the local level um, up to the national level, Julie, you've been at the forefront of childcare policy efforts and others. Um, you know, we heard a little bit today about families' experiences. We heard some about ch the childcare sector, but you've really dug into what's happening with the childcare sector and sort of the ecosystem between families and children. And I'm wondering if you can tell us about that and sort of what do you see as the best steps forward from where we are right now? Yeah, thank you, Vicki, and thanks for including me. Um, before I dig in on childcare, I just want to note, you know, listening to, to Dan and Richard before, I just, I was brought back to those moments at the beginning of the pandemic when um, my husband and I, you know, were both remote working and we were really trying to be equitable about the way we were doing it all. And two weeks into remote kindergarten with our son, my husband asked me for the password for school. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wait a second, I've been doing two weeks of remote learning without you. <laughs> so at the same time, he cooks dinner every night. So we'll, we'll take the, the division of labor, and we definitely know we're the lucky ones. Um, uh, so getting into the, the child care pieces of it, um, you know, we saw the House of Representatives actually pass a 400 billion dollar child care package in November of 2021. 
And that is the, you know, uh, probably a low end of what's really needed to build the childcare and early learning system that we need in this country. A system that will make it affordable for families, make it available to families, make sure that the early educators who provide such important care to our children are paid for their work. I had someone uh, in early education come up to me the other day at an event and say, I just want health insurance. Mm. And that bill didn't even include health insurance because it was more expensive, right? And so we are in this situation where if families can find childcare in their communities, it often costs about the price of public college tuition, rent, mortgage. Uh, many families can't find childcare because half of all American families before the pandemic were living in childcare deserts where they just did not find it, they could not find it. Um, and uh, at the same time as I noted that early educators are doing this work at poverty level wages. And that means that we're losing a lot of that workforce, right? That a lot of folks who train to do this work, who love doing this work with children, are going to you know, pour coffee at Starbucks or sell appliances at Home Depot because they can get benefits there. And so that actually then decreases the pool of childcare available for families and forces more and more families to just piecemeal it. And what that does is create more stress, right? That, you know, we saw that stress gender gap. I don't think I've heard about the stress gender gap before, but I felt the stress gender gap, <laughs> um, you know? And, and I think that that's, that's what's happening, that, you know, if you don't have reliable ongoing childcare, that means that you're going to have more work disruptions. That means that you're not positive that you can go to work with the peace of mind that your child is in safe nurturing situations. And that's going to be very disruptive for work and for employers as well. Um, and so, you know, we have a, a more than $400 billion problem that has been solved with zero dollars that were in the final economic package mm -hmm. that passed. So I'd say that's, that's a depiction of where we are in childcare today. Yeah. Um, and you've thought a lot too, and Century just did a report about the connection between childcare and industrial policy. So I know you have some thoughts about, about that and how these things fit together. Like I was really struck, um, I heard Felicia Wong from the Roosevelt Institute on the radio the other morning talking about how you know, some people measure infrastructure in the number of bridges that are built. And what we actually need to be doing is measuring the, bridge, the number of bridges that are built plus the jobs that are created plus the care that's being provided. And I thought that was a really interesting way to think through, like, how is it that we define what it is that we're going for with industrial policy or really with any policy that's privileging physical infrastructure over social infrastructure? And so I'm wondering, Julie, yeah, if you could talk a little bit about the recent report and um, what's next. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Emily Peck had this great quote in the New York Times, uh, great in that it's real, great <laughs> not, not great in that it's a good thing, um, but talking about how, you know, if, if the United States treated our physical infrastructure the same way we treated our childcare infrastructure, or am I doing that backwards, childcare infrastructure, yeah, physical, then you would have people, you know, asking their family members to hold up stop signs on the way to work, <laughs> right, and traffic lights. And, you know, basically we put it together with duct tape. Like that is the way we are doing care today. And so what's needed is actually building out infrastructure, right? There's not really a difference between physical infrastructure and care infrastructure. They're all part and parcel. They're all symbiotic. They're so connected. Um, and so one of the things that's really interesting is that at the beginning of the Build Back Better process, we were talking about the American Families Plan and the American Jobs Plan and how these needed to go together because families and work, right, there's, there's, we're not talking balance. We're talking about how they're all interconnected. And that was the original vision and they got broken apart and the physical infrastructure pieces got through Congress and the care agenda got left on the cutting room floor, as you said. And so what that means is that as we want to create millions of new jobs that the federal government's investing in, if we want those jobs to get filled, we're gonna have to do something about those parents who want to work in those jobs, who want safe nurturing care for their kids that they do not currently have. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think, I think uh, you know, Representative Conner and Bridget were talking before about 
the importance of the, the CHIPS proposal um, from the Department of Commerce, the, the CHIPS announcement from the Department of Commerce, where they're basically saying, look, we're not going to be able to fill these manufacturing jobs, these jobs constructing these factories, unless we have parents part of that workforce. So we need to provide that child care to make sure those parents can participate. And I think that's, it shows just exactly how tied together they are. Yeah, and it'll be, I mean, but to your point about child care supply, also I think one of the questions is if you're telling companies that they have to provide child care but you're not doing anything to strengthen the child care workforce, I think it's a very interesting experiment to see what happens. Like, can you actually create all of these child care spots if you're not also incentivizing good jobs for child care workers. Yeah, that's a great point, Vicki. I think a lot of what we're thinking about now that that announcement is out is how do we make sure there's adequate stakeholder engagement with all the different players in child care? How do we make sure that you know people aren't just getting you know, some money to pay for something that doesn't actually exist or, you know, to crowd out all of the small businesses that are owned by women, by women of color who are providing childcare, right? So we're really thinking about how do we make sure that this works, that it does get enough money, both from the federal level, from the corporate level, from states and localities to make it a success. Yeah, which I'm going to turn now to Shonda because one of Main Street Alliance has done such an amazing job organizing small business owners um, listening to their lived experiences and advocating on their behalf. And in fact, Marcia uh, Finn St. Hilaire, who's a child care provider here in DC, has just been a wonderful advocate on the DC paid leave campaign, on the national paid leave and child care efforts. Um, and you know, I think about her when we're talking about creating more child care jobs. And she, you know, she's been a great example of somebody who has done paid leave for her workforce, who does pay good wages. Um, she's here. We've had her speak here at New America before, I've testified in Congress with her before, but Shonda, um, sort of going from, from that, like how do you think about all of this? You know, you, you and your staff are talking every day to small businesses and business owners and entrepreneurs across the country about what they're struggling with and how they want to create good jobs for their workers um, with very little in the way of government support for the kinds of things that make jobs good jobs and the kinds of supports that their workers need too. And so, um, tell us like what you're hearing and what kinds of policies do the work the businesses that you work with need? Well, let me tell you a little bit about Main Street Alliance for people who don't know Marcia yes. or Corinne Henderson and the countless names of folks who organize with Main Street Alliance. Um, we organize first thinking about what's disrupting the circular economy. The first thing we think about are organizations like Amazon, big box, and corporations. If they don't pay their fair taxes, then we don't have the investments for these types of public investments like paid leave, care economy, and retirement. Um, so that's the first step. And I think the second question, Julie, you had a lot of things in there. <laughs> so I might ask you just to go back to that last piece that you were asking me about. What was your last question? At the it was like, what, yeah, what policies do you need? I mean, we, we've talked about what families need, but also families are workers, and workers are the people who are working for the small businesses that Main Street Alliance works with and represents, and also for the business owners mm -hmm. that you work with, like what would be helpful? Yeah, that's, uh, well, I think it's also, well, I think it's really important to think about small business. I define small business as true small business, meaning that those who are solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, and employ 20 employees or less. And when you think about that, you're not thinking about those bigger businesses, right? On average, they earn about $51,000 or less. So it's not owner versus worker, it's owner and workers working in partnership to organize to change these policies. And so when we get that kind of going through your head, um, when you go through pandemic, I was talking to KB, who's a small business owner, a re-entry small business owner in Minneapolis. So because he's a re-entry status, he and his wife didn't qualify for uh, PP loans, right? So if they get sick, which they did, he got sick, then his wife got sick, that means you have to train your body to do something that's inhumane. And oftentimes, that's black and Latino workers who are doing this. So we saw a surgeons in um, small businesses, um, of about 10 million. I think that might be the right number. And then when you think about Latina, uh, Latino businesses and black businesses, the majority of those were women. And those women are often caregivers, right? So you're not only providing care for your family, you're providing care for your, um, your children, but also your, your parents who are also aging. And so I think when we think about these policies, just being clear who's at the backbone of those, and those are people who are um, black and Latino and urban centers and also rural communities as well. 
Yeah, the rural thing is something I've been thinking a lot about. Yeah. We did a report here on the intersection between um, rural care policies, rural workforce demographics in the rural in rural communities across the country, distances to hospitals, and how that um, how that affects the kind of care. And so I'm glad that you brought rural into the conversation. Yeah. So many of the places that are moving paid leave policies right now, for example, are looking at child care places like New Mexico, Vermont, um, Maine, Minnesota, places that are very diverse economically, that are, some of them are diverse racially and ethnically as well, certainly diverse economically. Um, this wasn't on our list of questions, but I'm curious, you know, for all of you actually, particularly for Julie and for Shonda, um, how do you see opportunities, I guess, across uh, coalitions that marry geographies together to advocate for policies that we haven't, you know, that traditionally have been thought about as urban policies um, or policies where the faces are urban folks? Well, I mean, I can start from the organizer perspective. And I'd love to hear you from the um, policy perspective. Um, Watoga Feli and I just did uh, about 40, 45 or 48 business, I want to be precise, in rural Western North Carolina. Mm. and. There are people who didn't look, look like me going in to talk about investments into these public services. And we didn't start the conversation off talking about we need to get paid leave and child care because people automatically think, wait, not of my taxes. I already can't survive mm -hmm. already. But it's about understanding what your power is in organizing. These are public investments, not a, 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 an opportunity for you to pay more taxes because most small business owners are already paying there enough. So they're not talking about folks. We're talking about folks of all stores accounts to put their investments in that so we can have a pool of investments. What would you think, say about policy? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things is as we build out our industrial policy, a lot of that's going to take place in these rural areas, right? right? And so rural areas are places where there's the biggest childcare deserts, where people just don't have access to it. Um, and so that's gonna be even more important that we're marrying the, the industrial building out, the job creation, the job training with the care needs of yeah. the workers, right? Yeah, and just to add, I think, you know, we've been talking a lot today about families with children. We haven't talked as much about families with, with elder care or with uh, care for people with disabilities in their families, and that's a huge piece. We've got 53 million caregivers in this country, 11 million sandwich generation caregivers caring both for an older, an adult in their family and for a child. Um, in rural communities, for example, skilled nursing facilities are three times as far as they are in urban communities. Hospitals that deal with cancer, uh, cancer treatment, cardiology treatment are three, three times as far. And caregiving is, caregiving needs and expectations are bigger in rural communities where there are fewer working age people um, for older people. And so, and in, this is true everywhere. Um, so I don't know, yeah, I, I'm curious, and you know, we've talked a lot about the child care piece for businesses in particular. I would imagine the elder care piece, caring for older adults is a big deal. Um, curious if anybody's got reflections on that. Sophia, I don't know how much this comes up in your work at First Shift. I know you deal mostly with parents and mothers, but so many people are caring for both. Yeah, I would say we, all, we work with you know, folks who are caring for others, but also people who are seeking care and time off for themselves mm. um, we, and navigating that process. Um, he, I, you know, we have had clients who have had a difficult time getting the paid leave um, for medical leave because the process is not as straightforward as it could be. Um, there's the whole medical certification process and you know anyone who has you know worked with a doctor to get things get things filled out knows that can sometimes take time and there is a set amount of time you have to submit the application so so like issues with not having access necessarily to a computer or a printer to print the form not having transportation to go and drop off and check in with the um, medical provider to get certification, that has been an issue and has been a barrier to people accessing paid leave, unfortunately. And that's something that we continue to advocate for because we want to make sure that people who have, who are eligible for leave are able to access it. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. Yeah. And from a small business perspective, Shonda, I know some of your, the folks that you work with have talked a lot about what it means when an employee gets sick and right. they want to be able to provide yeah, care. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think that's a really important, like I, I come from three generations of small business owners and um, being a small business owner myself and having to, to work. And when I was doing more consulting work, um, just as a personal um, story, is that I wasn't thinking about retirement investment too. So not only people are working just 
to death, they're working themselves to death, and uh, we're not providing the care we need. But then when our small business owners get at the end, there's not enough pot in the pool to stop, you know, or to even put. So if you can't provide that for yourself, you can't provide that for your employees. So, so that's what I think about when you offer that question. Yeah, and I think, if I can offer this, I think about um, there's a small business owner in Minnesota, which is moving paid leave this year, and she's been involved in this fight for forever. Um, and she has talked a lot about her, um, her name is Sarah, and she owns a vinegar and oil store. Oh, she's uh, she, MSA yes, member. Yes, she's an yeah. MSA member, yeah. And she, um, Sarah Piepenberg, or yeah. Piepenberg, yeah. Sorry. And she wrote this really, she's spoken before she's testified, but she talked about how her employee got sick, had broken both arms, and she went to deliver groceries to this woman's house. She provided, um, she provided paid leave at the expense of having to forego her own rent and fell behind. Um, and then I believe she cared for her also when this woman was sick and dying. And um, she did the calculations about how much it cost out of pocket to provide paid leave versus how much it would cost for the state to have a paid leave program in place. And super compelling. Um, same testimony last week from Vermont from one of your, your yeah, business right. owners. So thank you for the work that you all Absolutely. do in helping small businesses present the, bus the real business case for these policies because so often we're seeing large corporations speak for business and we know that that isn't the case. Uh, absolutely. Um, I just want to remind folks, we're getting a couple questions in, but um, if you are joining us virtually, you can uh, submit your questions through Slido um, on the right side of your screen. If you're in the room and you have questions, please just write them out on a piece of paper or scan the QR code and we can start integrating them. Can I just add about, Please. Um, I think the American Rescue Plan is a really good lesson on how we can invest in all of these pieces together, right? So what we saw with the American Rescue Plan as a result of very significant advocacy and the fact that we actually could see the problems in a way that we hadn't seen them as obviously before, we were able to get $50 billion in childcare funding to help stabilize the childcare sector and support families. Not nearly what was needed, didn't build the system we'd always needed, it just helped employers and um, the you know, child care employers and providers to stay in business, to pay the rent, to pay their um, employees. And yeah. we yeah. also were able to get Medicaid home and, home and community based services funding that has gone out to help serve more families, to serve um, more people. And in states like Illinois, they were able to raise their rates and actually pay better. Uh, for their home and community-based workforce. Um, and states and localities are using state and local money for paid family and medical leave. And so, you know, Colorado had built out their system, but they didn't have enough money to fund it all. And they were able to use some of the American Rescue Plan dollars to help support that. So it's actually a great example of policy working that we, we saw when the federal government invests in the care agenda, it matters. People get paid better, people get the care they need, more people are included. Um, you know, the problem, of course, is that this money is all going to go away or has already gone away to some extent. Mm -hmm. And so we need to use that as a lesson on what we need to do next rather than just say it was a one time pandemic related emergency. Julie, I'm really glad you brought that up. And also, I'm really mindful that we have a lot of researchers in this room. And so there's a lot of fodder for research to be done. Um, you talked about the money going away. I know there is talk about this childcare cliff and what that means. Um, what advice do you have for folks who are in this room who want to be part of efforts to make sure that the cliff doesn't lead to calamities and crashes, if we're gonna, whatever, yeah. use that metaphor. What can we do knowing that the childcare cliff is coming to bolster the evidentiary case, the storytelling case, to try to convince Congress to uh, continue some of that funding or build on it? That's a great question. And just to be clear, so the child care stabilization money that came from Congress must be spent by September of this year. So that means that's about seven months more that uh, states have this money to spend. It has already gone to serve about 200,000 providers and about almost 10 million children. And so one of the things is trying to figure out, you know, what are the stories about what's worked, why it's been successful, how it's been effective, and what are the consequences going to be when it goes away? What does that mean? I have an image that the sector that was already struggling, that was already at a deficit before the pandemic, and then hit hard by the pandemic, is not going to recover to where it was before the pandemic. I think things are going to be worse. And I'd love to know if, if we can predict some of that and tell some of that as, you know, both through 
quantitative data and the qualitative stories of, of the people experiencing it directly. Great, okay, I'm gonna go to some of the questions that we've gotten here. Um, so it isn't lost on me and wasn't lost on me as we were designing this panel that we are all women sitting here. Um, I felt better about the non, uh, the homogeneity of our gender identities sitting up here because there were only men presenting other than Bridget earlier in the day. Um, but we I know in every conversation that comes up, there is the question of how do we bring more men into this movement. Um, folks like Equimundo, Gary Barker have done a good job. They're convening a table of dads and men's organizations. But this isn't, I mean, part of my reflections at least about International Women's Day and Women's History Month is really the importance of men, not just as allies, but as partners in this work. Um, and in, you know, sort of the lived experiences of dads that do experience, we know that there's generally a fatherhood uh, bonus, but there are men that, that experience discrimination from caregiving that try to hide it. Um, Sophia, you know, I don't know, I know for ship mostly works with moms, but maybe there are dads that come to mind. As you're thinking about this work, but also how do we, men do 40% of caregiving in this country and yet their caregiving is often invisible or either like inappropriately applauded as superhero um, or minimized and invisible because we talk about these issues as women's issues. So I'm just curious, there's not really so much a question here as like reflections that you have on how do we make this a conversation that spans gender and how do we make clear that women's equality and the things like the wage gap and workplace discrimination and the other barriers that women face in the workplace also require that men and people across all genders um, sort of be part of this fight? I mean, historically, uh, you know, women have just always been care providers. That's just, that's just a true thing. Um, but at the same time, I've been having a lot of conversations with men who are providing care for their aging parents, and we often don't talk about that. Or when we think about paid leave, we think about that the, the, the early part and just kind of drop off. But we all know someone that we got to care for, including ourselves, especially if we think about our circular economy and going back to the business structure. Um, with all of our successes that we've had with Main Street Alliance over the years, healthcare and paid leave have definitely been the part of that. And overwhelmingly, our work have been white males over 65 who in, in, engage in the paid leave conversation. So I think it's really just about expanding like what it is, what it's always been, and what it is now, and who's all a part of that and care. What would you add on? So much sense. Um, I think you know. I think about the research that we heard about today from Dan and Richard, and how um, that told a story of how when men were able to be more involved with childcare and with domestic labor, that that did change the situation. That more women were working, right? Yeah. And so that was a really supportive answer to that. Um, so I feel like, you know telling stories like that, you know, getting that research out into the world, you're welcome, um, <laughs> you know, is a, is a um, you know, important part of the equation. Yeah. yeah, I would just add that also being inclusive in our language and these narratives I think would play, go a long way. And also when, you know, fathers are trying to access these programs, making sure that you're thinking of both, uh, both caretakers, mothers, fathers, whoever the caretaker is, in the way that you're um, creating these programs. So to ensure that, you know, if for example, you wanna take after six months, after your child is born, you're a father and you wanna take leave, that you're getting a wage replacement that you expected. So you still have the fight, you have the opportunity through paid leave, but you also have um, financial security. And yeah. that's not always, um, evaluated when creating these laws. Yeah, I'm really glad you raised that. I mean, one of the key insights of the paid leave movement over the last several years and most of the laws that have passed have been improved in this way is making sure that the wage replacement is adequate because if we have a gender, a gender wage gap and we have a huge gender wage gap, especially for women of color, for black women and Latino women and some Asian women and native women, if you don't, if you have two opposite sex caregivers in a family and one of them earns lower wages and one of them earns higher wages and the higher wage earning person is male, that person isn't gonna take leave if the wage replacement rate is low. Right. And, um, and then you need job protection as well. And so these are features that we've built into programs in addition to making them gender equitable on paper. So I'm really glad you raised that point. Um, actually, the next question is a paid leave question. So Maine, um, this is a question from Kim Simmons, and I agree with her. Maine has an exciting paid leave bill coming. Um, they have a, a bill that is going to be pending in the legislature that's been the product of a work group. 
they will go to the ballot if they can't pass it through the legislature. Um, but Kim's question is actually about the interplay between federal policy and state policy. Um, so Maine has an exciting paid leave bill coming, but we need federal policy instead. Uh, can we offer any strategic advice on this because advocates are exhausted? And Kim, I agree with you. <laughs> I, I see that exhaustion um, as somebody who's been working on this policy for the last 13 plus years. Um, I guess I would offer first, like I wanna celebrate the tremendous growth and momentum. Um, when I started working on paid family medical leave in 2010, there were two states that had laws, California and New Jersey. We now have 11 plus DC, or sometimes as we say, 12 including DC, because DC should be a state. Um, and there are several more in the pipeline, potentially this year, Minnesota, we talked about Vermont, we talked about Maine, we talked about New Mexico, um, Illinois, Pennsylvania, potentially. Um, Oregon is going into effect this year. We'll, we'll start paying benefits, Colorado next year. Maryland and Delaware are coming down the pike as part of that 11 plus DC. And we've seen improvements. The states that have created paid leave programs have learned from the experience, have improved wage replacement rates, have added job protections, have added family members so that we have a broad inclusive definition of family. Um, and that's been really exciting. But I agree, ultimately, if we go state by state, we're still gonna end up with this have, have not situation, this lottery of bosses and geography. Um, and you know, I guess I would say that state success builds to federal success. And, and this goes to, to Shonda, I think we've also seen the large business organizations start to say, okay, federal policy. Like we actually saw the Chamber of Commerce in Vermont testify last week and say, ultimately we need a federal policy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know, reflections, especially from you, Shonda, you know, small business owners are often mischaracterized as being opposed to these public policy interventions, but as you've talked about, they're actually beneficial to workers and to businesses, and especially when those people are the same. Yeah, so. yeah I mean, I don't know, um, the question is about between federal and state. I'm, I'm an organizer, so I think that we always gotta be focused on state uh, policies all the time, and then also going back to make sure that those policies are enforced and stronger and keep improving on that. Um, where we are with federal, with what you talked about with Build Back Better, um, and where we are in our economy, I just wouldn't, I don't focus, I'm, I'm hopeful. We always are hopeful and we're organizing for that horizon point, but I'm, uh, I really believe this person's writing in for Maine, it's just that the investment in Maine and then the tipping point with all the other states that you, that you led will be the catalyst to change at the federal level. Yeah, yeah. any other reflections? from you all? Um, you know, I think there's there's two sides to this. On the one hand, here's my cynical side, right? That I like it that side. is, yeah, right? I mean, it's real. So like, we have a vicious cycle where moms don't have access to childcare, you know, we don't have paid family and medical leave. And what that means is that moms, especially women in general, can't get ahead in the economy, can't make more money, can't build up their wealth. That also then means that they can't influence the political process, they can't be a part of the political process. Mm -hmm. And so now we have, you know, a bunch of mostly like older white dudes who are wealthy, whose, you know, wives mm -hmm. stay at home with their kids, who are making our policies. Mm -hmm. um, it's changing, it's getting better. More moms are joining Congress and more women are joining Congress and more people from different backgrounds and different economic backgrounds are joining. But until that changes, it's going to be really hard to change federal law. So I think that's the, the cynical mm -hmm. side. Right. The hopeful side is we literally passed all these policies over the last two years in Congress for the first time through the American Rescue Plan and the other COVID relief packages. We've seen we can do it. And so let's build on that momentum. Yeah. Sophia, from, from what you've seen here in DC, working with a local organization that's been pushing for local policy, what lessons would you impart, I guess, on what's been effective and how might that translate into federal action? Yeah, I, well, I wanna add, even if we don't have a federal paid family leave law at, you know, at this moment, I would look to things that have passed and see how they can in, like not directly, but kind of indirectly um, support you. Like uh, for example, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act passed recently. And while that's not directly related to paid family leave, it, um, DC has a pr pregnancy accommodation law too. And we can use that to strengthen ours. And with that protection and having more, um, with having a stronger law, we can advocate for people to access paid leave more. more. So I think, even though it might not directly be uh, affect or support your law, you can look at some of the federal laws that have passed and it can support 
the overall kind of effort to uh, support folks and work and care. Yeah, well, and we build evidence from all of these things too mm -hmm. that help to create the economic arguments, for example, that Rokana was talking about that lots of people have been leaning into over the last couple of years. Um, they, they, yeah, start to dismantle misunderstandings and myths about how these policies are costly rather than how these policies are cost savings. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think the other thing too that comes to mind is thinking about the geographic clusters of laws. So for example, DC passed paid family leave, Maryland is in the process of implementing a new paid family leave law. Virginia, for the first time this year, um, passed paid family leave through one chamber, through the Senate. And whereas before, I mean, this goes to your leadership question, like Virginia's legislature has some new members, they will have more going forward, um, but even some of the opponents of paid leave in the Senate who stopped it from getting a vote or moving through committee before flipped this year mm -hmm. and allowed it to pass. So I see that as a hopeful sign and as you, and Delaware has, has paid leave. So as you like grow these clusters, it helps at least regionally to make a case that doesn't help the swaths of the country that don't have anything and won't have anything and that's, that is why we need federal policy, but the evidence, the stories, the organizing, success begets success is what I would say. Um, we've only got two minutes left, and I wanna make sure to get folks out of here in time. Um, and uh, I, I, yeah, I guess I actually just wanna turn it over to each of you for any last reflections. We've covered a lot of ground, Richard and Dan covered a lot of research. Um, there's a lot more to be answered, I think, about single parents and um, families that are, are non-traditional in terms of structure. There's a lot to be answered in terms of folks that, that um, are gender fluid, um, where we don't know as much about experiences and where there might be overlapping multiple forms of discrimination or bias that are impacting experiences. There's a lot to know about different kinds of sectors and industries. Um, and there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot to digest here, so I'm just curious for your last thoughts as we close out. Um, and I'll start with, with Shonda and come this way. Um, well, thank you for this opportunity um, to be with, uh, share space with all of you. I think the thing that I would encourage people to think about when you think about true small businesses, uh, keep that number in head of $51,000. We're not talking about owners or overlords. We're talking about people who are collaborative with workers to have good jobs and investment around paid leave in the care economy. Um, thank you. I think, you know, we are eagerly awaiting the president's budget tomorrow. We are following a lot of great work in the states where we are getting, as Wendy Chun Hoon would say, models and mobilization and momentum. Um, and, you know, I think I'm a pragmatic idealist. So I think that there's a lot of hope out there and a lot of work to do. Yeah, I'll just add that I, as we advocate for stronger laws and protections, it's always very important to be in community with folks who are actually experiencing these laws and making sure that we're centering and uplifting their voices at all times. Well, thank you all. It's been a great conversation um, to close us out. And I will turn it back to Bridget for any last words. <laughs> <laughs>